from I'm between Greenville and Asheville. Um, so I am uh, looking out at the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, finally got internet access here after five months of living in the house that we built kind of up in the hills. Um, believe me, it is it is challenging to run an online only company in a pandemic from your home without good internet access. Uh, and I'm still not sure I have great Wi-Fi, so I don't have like the whole grid thing all over my house yet. Um, but I did wire the whole house for Ethernet. So eventually I'll get around to actually crimping cables and all that kind of stuff. So when Drupal Commerce to market. What, what that means to us is evaluating how we maintain the project, uh, how we communicate about the project, uh, resetting our relationship as maintainers, um, because taking something to market means actually like, like communicating to purchasers or buyers in a way that they, they understand what you're selling or what you're offering. Um, it, it means uh, not necessarily saying all the same things everybody else is saying, but it certainly means speaking in the same categories that everybody else speaks in. Uh, so, for example, uh, when you buy any other e-commerce software in the world, uh, or even with many of our open source competitors, when you adopt their software, uh, they talk about vendor support. They talk about development roadmaps. Uh, they talk about their partner agencies with strong track records of success. And these are the things that they communicate about their platforms to help merchants adopt them, right? Because at the end of the day, the person who's buying an e-commerce platform is a merchant. It is somebody who has something to sell and they don't want to become an e-commerce software specialist. They just want to be able to sell their stuff. <laughs> uh, and when they, uh, make the choice about what software they'll use to help them sell. They, they don't want to then have to, um, you know, create an entirely new paradigm of doing business with with that software. Uh, in other words, there are companies out there, um, and, and we presented case studies on them, who adopt Drupal Commerce and they just uh, build it, manage it, maintain it in house, and grow with it. Uh, but those are technical companies, or else they have like a technical staff person or founder who's able to to basically manage that. And then that company basically becomes a software company and a product sales company. But once you scale out to the market at large, I mean, there, there are entire e-commerce conferences and market sectors where people don't ever even really talk about software or customizing software. They, they really just talk about platforms and plans and paradigms and having to think about fewer things is good for them in the middle of their purchasing decision. Um, so this is just just all preamble, and it, but but it does explain why we changed our name last year from Commerce Guys to Centaro. Um, and the reality is, Commerce Guys was a fun name when we started the company in 2009. It was literally me and a couple of guys I knew in the Drupal community. Um, but that's you know uh, at the very least, we'll say it's a very professional services oriented sounding name. You you hire people to do work for you. You don't necessarily buy software from them. But we see our future more in what can we offer to merchants to buy, not in can we just scale our team so more people can hire us. Let's talk about why. But first, uh, you know, when I say let's take Drupal Commerce to market and talk about why we do this, the question may come up, isn't it already in the market? After all, aren't there almost 60,000 Drupal Commerce sites in the wild? And the answer, of course, is yes. Um, you know, there, there are almost, well, I guess, uh, on an on average, around thirteen thousand uh, commerce two dot x sites live from week to week, uh, and this is I think this number is about five thousand more from the last time I, I prepped these sites. So we've grown, you know, or, or we will be poised to grow by the end of the year, um, you know, a hundred percent in terms of our our gross uh, like site count. Uh, and so there, there's a very strong case to be made that like, well, there, there's, there's, there's no taking Drupal Commerce to market. It's already there. Um, but, but the reality is uh, if, if you went anywhere else <laughs> uh, in the like e-commerce software industry and, and you asked people, what is Drupal Commerce? Um, 
you know, some people might even know it exists. Some people might be able to say, well, isn't it kind of like the WooCommerce for Drupal? Uh, and, and then like questions would then come up, but like, does anybody support it? Where do I go to get my questions answered? Does it do feature X, Y, or Z? Like, like, in other words, it might be in the market, but Drupal Commerce doesn't have a definition in the market. And, and, if, it, and if it isn't like a defined thing, it's, it's really not something that, that a merchant who doesn't have deep Drupal experience or, or an agency partner with Drupal experience, it just, just doesn't know how to think about it. Uh, and I think, frankly, that, that Drupal Commerce loses more opportunities in more purchasing decisions or, or buying conversations for, for lack of definition than it does for lack of capability. Uh, again, just, just I'll say it one more time. I think that, that Drupal Commerce loses competitively not because it's incapable of doing what a merchant needs, but because it's just too ambiguous. It's not defined. And even if you go to drupalcommerce.org, right? Not, not to beat us up too hard, but go to drupalcommerce.org, go to the project page on drupal.org, go to our own company website, centaro.io, and, and ask like, well, does Drupal Commerce do X? And, and it's, it can be challenging to find an answer. But the thing is, like, uh, we aren't we aren't just falling over and dying. In other words, there's something there that's worth using right now, even if it's hard. <laughs> um, in other words, e even if we aren't necessarily helping non-technical people um, or just CIOs or CMOs or CTO or the the VP of e-commerce, these people that work at merchants make the decision to buy Drupal Commerce, and I, I'm using buy in quotes, it's open source software, but we'll say hire somebody to implement it for them. Even though we aren't making it easy, still there are almost you know, 60,000 sites out there. And they process by our estimates, you know, over $2 billion a year in transactions. I, I personally know um, nine figure Drupal Commerce sites in the wild, right? That's over $100 million in sales through one Drupal Commerce site. Like these sites are out there, and uh, and and they aren't slowing down. And I would I would venture to guess that, as with Drupal eight in general, um, the sites that are launching on Drupal Commerce today are more complicated, operate at a higher scale, and do more sales than five years ago. Um, that's not to say that the commerce guys in ages past didn't have. Um, big successful projects under our belts, but um, but I see it more frequently, and I hear it from e even people that I see in the chat rooms. You know, and, uh, in this session, uh, I know some of the sites that you're working on are, are tremendous and, and large. Um, and, and one of the things that like we we've often pushed against in our marketing <laughs> is this idea that you can somehow boil Drupal Commerce down to a feature list, uh, and so you just have like the 10 page PDF that has bullet, 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 just cataloging the whole index of features. Um, and, and part of the reason we resisted that impulse is because um, we like, we know it's kind of fake, right? Um, like we know when we're evaluating other people's software, once you dig into the bullet points, like, um, you know, what they mean by a feature may not be what I need or expect. And, and even with many enterprise um, e-commerce vendors out there, I, I'm, I'm not saying they like blatantly lie in their marketing, although I'm, I'm sure that there are people who do. Um, but more frequently, what we found is people who will adopt under the platform, say, big commerce, because it claims to have a connection to their point of sale system. And then once they're halfway through the replatforming, too late to turn back, they realize, oh, that integration that I was told existed is like bare bones or it's not customizable. It's great for like a very narrow use case, but not mine. Uh, and so, so we, we do still try to communicate about like, what does it mean to adopt Drupal commerce as a framework? Uh, and, and we, you know, this is kind of like the beginnings. If I, whenever I go to talk to people about what can it offer, you can see in the, in the left side, the bullet points start kind of from the, like the customer experience in. So it's, how do I view a product catalog, navigate it, uh, you know, get, get a price, add it to my cart, proceed through checkout, and then administer that order as an administrator. Uh, this is kind of how we, how we present the features of Drupal Commerce. Um, but I'd say that it's, it's not really enough 
um, at the end of the day, <laughs> eventually we are going to have to have that that awesome feature list that says exactly what Drupal Commerce can do. But but for these bullet pointed reasons and many others, people are adopting Drupal Commerce, and and they are especially adopting it in scenarios where they where they care about flexibility or customizability. Um, and and what we talk about, and I, I don't think I have a slide for this. Yeah, we'll just go back here. If you look on the the right hand column specifically that the second bullet point we talk about like multi right multi checkout flow singular multi-page checkout or in the left hand column multi-currency we all know drupal can be multilingual multi-domain multi-store when you're when you're trying to find your niche in the market you have to find something that, that you do do better than everybody else and like chances are even if there's only like like one half of one percent of all merchants for whom hearing wow, I can have one system that does multiple stores and multiple languages with multiple currencies and multiple checkout. Like, even if that's one half of 1% of the e-commerce market, that's that's like tens of thousands of customers and, and more than enough business for the entire Drupal community to grow multiple e-commerce focused agencies, you know, out of these raw materials. Um, and so that's, that's the message that we take to uh, merchants that we're marketing to, to trade shows that we market at, to industry analysts that we speak to, you know, and I'll, get into some of that in a minute. But it's also what we we lean on our technology partners to propagate for us. So for example, um, if you go to the Stripe partner directory, you can you can go there today. And I think Square as well has one. Uh, Avalara has one as well. You can you can see this message that we're trying to put out there that people should take Drupal Commerce seriously because these companies are putting their stamp uh, of, of approval on it. Uh, and uh, that, that it has the um, the same kind of legitimacy as many of their uh, the other platforms they integrate, whether it's Magento, Shopify, um, Big Commerce, Volusion, et cetera, et cetera. And and the reality is, I mean, even with the whole the whole sort of feature set of the framework, right? All the tools and components you use to build a module or build a, an e-commerce site. Uh, even with all that, with all the integration work that we've done, like nobody's sitting back and resting on their laurels. If anything, like the pace of development is speeding up as, as we as a company grow and are able to put more people and steer more projects toward improving the, the code base. So if you just look at some of the recent releases, you know, we're adding checkout and admin address book support, VAT number collection and validation. That was in conjunction with work on the invoice module. Um, if you look at Matt's recent 2.20 release, we actually have another like just minor version release of German VAT rates because they have special tax rates during COVID-19 lockdowns. Um, Commerce 2.16 improved promotions, added cart expiration and other features. So, you know, these things aren't slowing down in core or in contrib. You know, we're currently working on a validation rules module that's also customer funded. Uh, where you can uh, use the same uh, conditions interface that we use for promotions to determine if a product is available for purchase, to validate an order state transition or checkout entry, all of that stuff. Uh, and then, of course, we continue to work on payment gateway integrations. There's always more payment gateway integrations. And, and very kind um, friends in the Drupal community sponsor a lot of this work. So the Commerce CyberSource module just had an initial release for Drupal 8 funded by a British um, company called Indigo Herbs that sells herbs and other supplements online using Drupal Commerce in the near future. Um, so th these things continue to be developed. And thanks to our Drupal 9 strategy, you know, on day one of Drupal 9, Drupal Commerce was Drupal 9 ready. Literally all we had to do was just remove the deprecated parts and pff, we, were, we were ready. <laughs> um, so all that was really cool. So yes, at the end of the day, Drupal Commerce is in the market and thankfully, we don't have to pause for another three years now to rewrite the platform for Drupal 9. Um, and this, it, it's hard to hard to kind of communicate exactly like what, what it meant for Drupal Commerce between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 to have to rewrite. But, but you, can, you can kind of illustrate it like this. Um, you know, uh, if we can assume that like Drupal Commerce and, and our nearest open source competitor, Magento, had some kind of parity, uh, right? At, once Drupal 8 comes out, the, the the Drupal commerce development kind of has to pause while Magento just continues to grow and evolve because we had to literally rewrite every aspect of Drupal commerce for Drupal 8. Um, so yes, we got to market and we had nice projects like Commerce Kickstart. We had some great customer launches with great logos. 
for who was using Drupal Commerce. But then it's like we had to put the whole like effort on pause to rewrite everything while all of our competitors were just getting larger and larger and more successful, growing their ecosystem uh, and expanding out their feature sets and integrations and so on. We don't have to do that, which is awesome. I, I love the fact that Drupal 9 and beyond, you know, these upgrades are automatic. And uh, the, the only thing that's going to drive any sort of rewrites for Drupal Commerce is our, is our own desires, our own needs, um, you know, maybe to change some aspect of the data model in the future. I don't know what that might be, but I can imagine it might be uh, something related to price lists for starters and, and who knows what else. Um, so at the end of the day, like Dr Drupal Commerce is in the market. Um, it has a wide customer base. Um, those, those customers are getting larger and becoming more successful. Like I said, many are doing millions of dollars a year through commerce. Some are doing millions of dollars a month, which is amazing. Um, so it is in the market. But like I said before, it's just it's complicated. Um, it's often not part of the conversation. Um, if you if you compare the numbers of Drupal sites that like the percentage of Drupal sites that use commerce to, you know, uh, you know, other environments or, or the gross number of Drupal commerce sites that, that are out there. Like even if we just consider Drupal 8, you're talking 13,000 stores compared to, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands or more stores on Shopify uh, or WooCommerce, right? Consider WooCommerce. Um, you know, I, I don't consider them like a, a, a realistic competitor from a, like a capability standpoint because they don't actually have like a, a, a robust data model behind them. <laughs> um, but still, they claim hundreds of thousands of stores because any WordPress blog out there, especially now that Automatic has bought them, can turn on an online store, much like Squarespace or other competitors like that. Um, additionally, um, you know, software strategies continue to multiply. Um, so, so there are many people who just want a SaaS e-commerce solution and then you know, adopt a completely you know, different strategy for, um, uh, for how to build the rest of the stack out. And, and I'm ashamed I didn't update my slide here. Rich Jones presented this at a previous DrupalCon, a whole session on how are big companies thinking about um, how to build out and manage their e-commerce platforms. Um, and, and of course, at the end of the day, we all know that proprietary platforms and, and SaaS dominate the press. Um, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, um, one single authoritative voice for a solution will have a louder and more focused voice in the market than uh, like even, even us as maintainers can have about Drupal Commerce because, um, you know, we're, we're a piece of the whole, right? We're just one part of what makes Drupal Commerce. We're the commerce modules, but there's this whole other like, like realm of, of what is Drupal. Uh, and, and we're a tiny part of that. So, so we, we just can't bring the same kind of voice to market where if you are a Magento or a Salesforce commerce cloud um, or uh, a Hybris, which I guess is SAP, I can't remember who owns who now, commerce tools, Spryker, any of these big e-commerce companies, um, you know, they can speak for the whole of what their software is and what their ecosystem is. Whereas we're in this kind of hybrid solution or hybrid situation. Um, additionally, like if, if you think about headless commerce, um, it's 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 a trending topic and it's certainly one that we're leaning into as Drupal, the Drupal commerce maintainers. Um, but it's it's also it's a far from settled market. So when we talk to I'm sorry, Fit for Commerce, this um, analysis firm here on the right hand side of the screen, um, like like they they are interested in hearing us out and they they help us understand where we fit in the broader e-commerce ecosystem. And, and they acknowledge that like, even though, you know, commerce tools, uh, Molten of course is now part of Elastic Path, Spryker, these other companies talk about API first and API based solutions. Like, like a lot of people just don't know what headless commerce means. Like I've, I've spoken with salespeople at big commerce who don't know what it means, even though it's all over their website. Um, so so the, we're in the situation where I said in the previous slide that, um, uh, and off, a single authoritative voice for a total platform, you know, has, has a louder voice in the market. Um, they're going to be able to define what headless commerce means uh, if, if we don't find some way to speak up and just speak specifically to Drupal Commerce's advantages. So this is one of the things that, that we're specifically focused on is, is how, how can we take um, our version of what headless web application development means in the Drupal context 
to market and say, this is the way that it ought to be done, everybody else. It's not just about buying an API and then building um, some kind of a JavaScript front end for it. Uh, it's actually about having you know, maybe both components under your control with your ability to customize your API as much as you can customize your front end application. If you need to, that our license and our community makes that possible as does just Drupal's general flexibility. Uh, and then of course, with Drupal Commerce, we know that we have some advantages over these other vendors when it comes to internationalization at the very least, because no other software community is as global and diverse as Drupal's. And when it comes to, to localization, whether that's languages, currencies, multiple domains, et cetera, or when it comes to accessibility, um, like none of these other solutions can reach the, just the sheer number of people that a properly implemented Drupal site with the commerce framework can. Um, and so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, as project maintainers is how will we get Drupal commerce where we want it to be? Because, because again, um, it, it's not that Drupal commerce hasn't found its, uh, a niche in the market. We just think it, we just think it should be bigger. <laughs> we think it should be more popular instead of 13,000 sites. I'd love to see 130,000 sites. Uh, but, but in order to have that kind of growth, we have to start speaking the language that, that these other vendors in the market are speaking. Uh, and that's again, just kind of why we've rebranded, why we've begun talking about Centauro support, why we're talking about Centauro Commerce as an e-commerce platform that's fully managed by the vendor. So there's still open source software, but you know, like it's, it's just trying to find a more rational message to the traditional software buyer. Um, so the, the first step, um, that, as we see it, is to continue to, to close our gaps, right? This is one, one very common thing for a software purchaser to do. And, and we do this on behalf of some of our customers. When you're buying new software is to evaluate them all against one another and find out what the gaps are. So what does platform A do well that B doesn't? What does B do well that A doesn't? So you have to be thinking in those terms to, to find uh, and, and close those gaps. And I've presented the Matt Smart, um, you know, case study, you know, many times, uh, both through the Splash Awards last year and, and uh, even yesterday in our in our sponsor session here at uh, DrupalCon Global. Um, they they went fully headless with Drupal Commerce, and and they were willing to and and wanting to give back to the Drupal community. Um, you know, as they've benefited from Drupal as well, right? So it's, it's that kind of company that says, hey, like we're, we're happy to invest in expanding the capabilities of the platform and we want to give that back because that makes everybody stronger and we benefited from the rest of Drupal. Why shouldn't they benefit from our investment as well? And this is how we see ourselves closing feature gaps most prominently is, is through customer funded development. Um, and so for example, just, just thinking off the top of my head, what are the initiatives uh, that we have going right now. Um, we're, we're doing work on commerce invoice, on commerce recurring. We're doing work on the commerce cyber source module, commerce PayPal, commerce square. Uh, we have um, a commerce fee module in progress uh, and a backend theme and maybe even some other things. All of this work in progress is, is directly funded by uh, customer investment. And so when we, when we talk with our customers, we're trying to find ways to, to is say like, hey, like we believe that we can satisfy your requirements uh, and close a gap in our feature set. You know, we're we're willing to do a certain part of the work ourselves uh, if you'll commit to funding this part of the work. And that's a, that's a very common story for us, and and a, a model that I think more companies could and should follow in Drupal in general. It's finding those ways to to use client uh, investment um, to fund your contributed module development. Um, if you look at just the MatSmart um, development pipeline alone, you go to their new website, motatoes.de. This is their German version of their site. That funded a heck of a lot of work in the JSON API module, uh, in the Commerce API module, which uh, just adds some additional sugar to core JSON API for commerce use cases. Um, Matt's on here, but I can't see the chat to see, to see everything else that it's funded, but, but a variety of other features that we depend on uh, the validation rules module is coming out of customer fund development, um, a few other things. So like, like this is like the dominant way that we're closing gaps uh, and, and we'll continue to do that. And, and again, encourage more of you to do that as well. In fact, if, um, Matt and Jonathan are two co-maintainers for commerce2.x. 
hold office hours twice a week. I believe it's on Tuesdays and Thursdays in two different time zones. And in those office hours in the Drupal Slack, we check in with anybody that has a project going um, to see like, well, what are, you, what are you up to? Do you need assistance on you know, knowing how to make sure this becomes part of the platform? We're really inviting people in both to give them support, but also to, to solicit their contributions back to the project. Um, so if, if anybody has any questions at all about how to help us take Drupal Commerce to market in a bigger way, by all means, join those, those office hours. Uh, and I, I can't remember the, the specific time zones off the top of my head, but if you go to our blog, uh, I was a few blog posts back um, that we talked about when those office hours are. And frankly, Matt, since you're listening, we should probably uh, get those office hours onto the project page on Drupal.org. That would be smart. Um, all right, so the next step beyond closing feature gaps was just reliable roadmap planning uh, and support for users. And we did this, we launched um, last year Centaur support. Uh, well, shoot, before I get ahead of myself, we do maintain the roadmap in the issue queue, um, but we're, we're trying to figure out how to better communicate this because an issue queue is just not uh, accessible to most non-technical users. Uh, and at recently was really encouraged by the, uh, the roadmap style of, ah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it was Jira. I, I feel like Jira has, um, if, if I'm remembering it right, um, just like like a nicer interactive roadmap that shows basically like recent wins, upcoming initiatives and long-term ideas. Something that's more than just a collection of issues in an obscure technology uh, <laughs> uh, website. Um, but all that to say, um, we also launched last year like a professional support program, we call it Centaro Support. And the idea behind that was just to give people, um, you know, direct answers in a Q and A site that, that's basically Stack Overflow. Um, so Stack Overflow launched Stack Overflow for Teams last year, um, and what it allows us to do uh, is basically use our, our our actual Drupal Commerce recurring um, subscription management site to serve as an SSO um, provider for Stack Overflow, so that we can. I uh, only let people into like our private team that um, that are paying us to access support in this way. Um, and so, so what we're doing is just building out, a, it's, it's a small base of um, highly engaged contributors and users. I know uh, at least one of them is here in the chat <laughs> um, and we're able to answer their questions and guarantee that we'll see every question that comes through uh, because it's not that we aren't active in Drupal support channels, but we're limited. Um, you know, we don't see everything that comes through the issue queue, right when somebody needs a question answered, we don't see everything that goes through Drupal answers. I'll, I actually answer a fair amount of questions still in Drupal answers, um, but I don't always have the time or the right person doesn't see it in a timely fashion. So that's what we're trying to, to bring really developer oriented support to market in this program so that merchants who adopt Drupal Commerce, you know, even if they don't need to work with us as a vendor or as a consulting firm or an agency or any of you, at least they know that if, if they get stuck on something tricky, they have you know, direct access to the maintainers um, to, to get unblocked and remain productive. So um, that's one of the things that we've done to try to improve support and basically be able to say like, yes, this actually is commercially supported by us as the vendor. Uh, and, and I don't want to overplay this, um, but, but, I, but I do want to say that like in, in the software market in general, um, not having support is a liability. Um, if, if people just don't know how to reach you or to get a question answered, now, and I'm talking about people that don't necessarily come from the Drupal community, if, if they don't see that there's some easy way to get support, it's a liability. And, it, and if they're doing their evaluation matrix, like, like Drupal Commerce will be penalized for not having um, that kind of support offering available. Um, so that's one of the things that we did. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing is, is related. It's trying to basically create a sort of um, um, good monetization strategy that lets us continue to invest in features while also serving merchants. Is really like like easing new user evaluation and onboarding. And we're doing this in like two ways. One is like community oriented and then one is commercial oriented. Um, so just in case you aren't aware, <laughs> um, in Drupal 7, uh, we, we were the kind of like the, the most successful company at taking advantage of the Drupal distribution paradigm. This is the idea that, that you could package um, Drupal core with contributed modules and themes 
and then like run an installation routine to basically make Drupal look like something else out of the box entirely. In our case, Commerce Kickstart basically looked like an e-commerce application. And, and we did this, and we started this development, I think, in 2012. It was like right after our Series A, we put like a whole team on this, had design, you know, hired a UX um, consultant, I think it was Boyan Summers, and really just went to town trying to make sure that if, if people were evaluating Drupal Commerce, they didn't just see Bartik and a bare bones framework that they had to click together and then go look at Magento and see, oh, this looks like store software. No, we wanted them to be able to install Drupal Commerce and see, oh yeah, this looks like shopping cart software and evaluate it on, on those merits. Um, when, we, when we started working on Drupal 8, we didn't really have the same um, tooling available. And we also didn't necessarily think it was the, the right paradigm because it, 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 was, it was a great demo, but it was challenging for people that wanted to actually like launch from it because it, it kind of mixed um, like uh, structural elements with, with demo content. And so like, if you wanted to, to remove the demo content from here, uh, you actually would lose things like your search index and then you'd be stuck trying to recreate the faceted search interface that we built in the demo content. So we, we found a better way to manage that in Commerce 2 with um, Drupal 8. And that was through our, our Commerce demo module uh, and a, um, a composer project template. So you can actually, I, I did this on my own laptop yesterday in advance of my session. You, you can type one command line command and you know install a complete demo store from which you can extract the demo content if you then want to go to town building your site. Um, and this demo is up at uh, demo.commercekickstart.com right now. It's just our basic demo. I think there's a screenshot of it next. Yeah, it's just our basic demo. Uh, and, and it has some um, like some progressive decoupling and that there's a, a, a cart fly out with some JavaScript elements to handle the add to cart process uh, versus just um, direct forms, API submission and redirects. Um, but it's, it's, it's a pretty like pretty standard, um, you know, reasonably attractive Drupal commerce demo store. And um, we have customers for whom this was enough. Um, you know, we, uh, if you go to uh, pmbswiss.ch, it's a, a Swiss provider of mountain bike suspension parts and systems. Um, uh, that's obviously a customized version of the Belgrade theme using a lot of what the demo framework shows you in terms of the same faceted search interface, the same cart flyouts. I think even one of the same payment gateways, um, Braintree, that, that we ship by default with, um, with, with demos. Um, and this is like a great starting point. And, and really, again, it serves the purpose of Commerce Kickstart in that like, like today, people aren't necessarily evaluating triple commerce against Magento, but they are evaluating against Shopify. And that's why like this, you know, frankly looks like it could be a shop of an attractive Shopify template it, down to the same cloud zooms. Or when you go to the checkout form, a two column checkout layout, that's, that's just pretty standard in the e-commerce industry right now. So we, we, we want to make it easier and easier for more people to evaluate. That's, that's also why we um, built um, a, a Drupal Commerce demo button right into Simply Test Me. So we worked with Adam Bergstein of um, Simply Test Me and of Acquia uh, and elsewhere um, to uh, basically uh, add a one-click button to launch the Drupal Commerce demo site on Simply Test Me. And you can log in as an administrator, you can click around, you can show people stuff. I think it's just admin, admin is the password once your instance is live. I think it stays up for like 24 hours or something like that on uh, Lullabot's tugboat um, as, as the infrastructure. And so if, if you're just evaluating Drupal Commerce or needing to demo it for somebody, you know, we, we invested in making this a reality. And so we, we encourage you to use it. <laughs> um, so otherwise our, our marketing dollars have gone to waste and that would be a shame. Um, so, so make use of these tools. Um, and then finally, what I, I said there were like the community aspects that we're investing in. And then there's also the commercial aspect. Um, th there are companies out there who want to use Drupal Commerce, but right now they don't want to maintain their own e-commerce application. These are companies that already have front-end teams. These are companies that have existing websites that they just want to embed a checkout form on and not necessarily have to like hire or retain a Drupal team uh, and build something from scratch. And that's why we started um, promoting earlier this year, Centauro Commerce. We've launched a couple of enterprise sites on it and are expanding it out to new sites as we go. And what it is, is it's, 
is just a headless commerce server that we manage uh, uh, for them. And, and we basically deliver it as open SaaS. It's open source software as a service. Um, so they are paying a subscription fee to have access to it. We make sure the lights stay on, that it's scalable if they have any spikes or peaks upcoming. Um, and at the end of the day, they can still take it with them when they go. They can take their data, they can take their, their site and, and you know, go manage it full stack themselves if they want to. But it, what we're, we're really focused on, again, a niche, headless commerce, um, and a kind of customer, say, that has multiple front ends or multiple territories. Uh, or like I said, they already have a JavaScript team but don't have a PHP team. Uh, or they, they have legacy websites they're trying to embed this into. That's the use case. And this makes it easier for them to adopt Drupal and then eventually begin to use Drupal more, right? They, they may, at the outset, just import their products and stay focused on their front ends. Um, but ultimately, they have that, that, that on-ramp onto greater customization of Drupal if they want to. Uh, and, and just to kind of um, illustrate just a little bit more what, what we're doing here is that, that we're saying that like typical full-stack Drupal commerce, we still totally support it. It's still the dominant pattern for building Drupal sites. Um, Centara support is available for anybody doing this that wants to just do it on their own, on their own infrastructure. Uh, and most full stack Drupal commerce sites just use a Drupal theme, the theme layer, maybe with some progressive decoupling via JavaScript components to present the whole thing. Uh, but there is a point at which the demands of customer experience and the demands of scalability require a greater decoupling. Uh, and, and for us, uh, like, the, like, honestly, scalability is the primary driver for our clients in decoupling. Um, you, you have to basically get, um, at the very least, Drupal sessions out of the pipeline. That's why one of the, the first things that we often do is use secure cookies to store cart IDs instead of creating Drupal sessions and then bypassing cache, and then using JavaScript um, to manage shopping carts. And eventually, you're, you're two steps away from full decoupling. And that's what like like a modern decoupled Drupal commerce can look like, is that you're um, these companies and these teams are really just focused on that JavaScript front end, and they're really outsourcing management of the platform to us, and always knowing in the back of their mind at any point in time, they can either retain a Drupal agency or hire their own Drupal staff to basically take over full maintenance of the application themselves. Um, and so what this means is that there, there are components of the Centaur Commerce version of Drupal Commerce that we maintain that are um, just, just kind of part of our SaaS. They allow us to, to basically manage a wide variety of these sites at scale and make sure we can deploy updates instantaneously to everybody, make sure that we can um, you know, keep the, the communications going between them and all of their integrated services, make sure that we can centralize logging and debug issues across the platform as need be. Um, but but you know, at any point in time, they can take on that you know, those burdens themselves, take the code, take the data off ramp, you know, go into Acquia or Pantheon or Platform.sh and run it themselves. But so long as they're with us, you know, the, the important thing for me is in this, this last bullet point, as long as they're working with us, they can start fast, they can, you know, focus where they're already focused, eventually take it over if they want to. But so long as they're with us, they benefit from that collaboration that, that we and our ecosystem are, are making in the software. So it's that automatic updates, automatic rollout of new features. Um, instant availability of new modules that we sort of make part of the platform and cover with automated test coverage and documentation. Make sure that it's all ready to work together. Um, that's that's really the the promise that that we're we're taking to people, and and it's why people are choosing to go this route. Um, and so I'm just going to close out with with one you know final question that that you might be asking, which is if we're talking about taking Drupal Commerce to market, why even talk about monetization? Uh, and and I hope the um, I hope the answer is satisfying. <laughs> uh, the answer is that maintaining a big open source project like Drupal Commerce is is difficult, uh, and it can lead to burnout, especially when you think about the um, the demands of free support. Even often becomes one of the most challenging aspects of building and growing a project like this. And and so we're thinking long term. Like we, we want Drupal Commerce to be around five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now. I've, I've got many years of work left in me, and it would be great if I'm 55 years old and still working on Drupal Commerce because, 
today, now, this year, next year, in the, in the, the ensuing short, uh, short-term future, we've implemented a monetization strategy that, that supports the project for longevity. Like, like it just takes sustainable revenue um, to keep our team together, to keep our team you know, able and uh, able to dedicate like the time and the energy to continuing to expand um, Drupal Commerce, but also like like monetization, frankly, is the, the only way that we'll be able to realize our vision in what is already a crowded market. Um, so so we, we are thinking about monetization just as much as we are thinking about features and roadmap and integrations. And as we are thinking about how can we help agencies do better and bigger projects, like all of these things to us are related. And, and, and really like these are the things that, that outside evaluators are looking for. Because if, if um, you know, just, just imagine like a Fortune 500 company that has millions of dollars on the line and a lot of exposure uh, from a compliance standpoint, a security standpoint, a privacy standpoint, like they, they want to know that the, the software they choose will be supported, not just for the next six months, or not just if Matt happens to be in Slack at the right time to answer a question, because they have a lot on the line. And so, so talking about monetization, talking about roadmap, talking about support, talking about us being a vendor and having partner agencies and specialists in our community and all that stuff, like that's all about legitimizing the project. Um, so, so we can go play where everybody else is playing because like Shopify, you know, they don't deserve to just be the unchallenged king of the hill, nor does anybody else. And, and we think that there's a very strong case for Drupal Commerce in many areas where it's not currently even known, uh, not being considered, much less being ruled out. Um, so j- just in closing, you know, really thank you for your time. Uh, and, and even more so, thank you for your contributions. I, I know many of the people that I saw checking in in the chat have contributed to Drupal Commerce, continue to contribute, uh, or have contributed in years past to Ubercard and other projects that I've been associated with, or just many of you are, are Drupal contributors in general. And, and everything that, that you know, you're all doing is, is fantastic. Um, and, and it really energizes us. Um, it, it makes... Uh, it makes a lot of the maybe the the pain <laughs> of writing yet another automated test, rolling yet another point release to address a security issue. Like it makes it worth it when we see that people are doing cool stuff um, with this this code that we've written. So um, thanks again. Uh, I, I don't know what happens when a session is done if I'm just supposed to like bug out, um, but I am happy to answer questions um, if anybody wants to ask questions. I guess that's one advantage. Nobody's gonna like come around and yank me off the stage. <laughs> um, all right, I see some comments coming through there. Thanks, everybody. Um, I I don't know exactly what Javier wants to uh, to add to the conversation, but I'm gonna add him to the moderation panel. Let's see what happens. <laughs> oh, maybe he's already uh, come up. Uh, no, I I don't have fifty dollar bills. Uh, but if you uh, if you send a thousand dollars to my Bitcoin address, I'll send you two thousand dollars back. I think that's the thing to do today, right? Nice. Okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna keep it live all night. I've got a nut brown ale in the refrigerator. It's dark outside, so. Uh, <laughs> um. All right. Yeah, Ryan, I, I hear your concern. Yeah, that, that that was the question, right? Like. What does it mean to call something Centaro Commerce? Does that mean that we're we're, we're closed sourcing Drupal Commerce or or sort of open coring it and then closing some of the best features? And you know the answer for us is no. Like that that really flies in the face of the the, the open source principles that we've upheld and championed. Um, but if we don't have a a name that we actually can brand and take to market and, and present as a vendor. Uh, then we are um, handicapped in the market, uh, or, or at least we're not not considered mature. Um, so uh, yeah, I think um, the the name you know, it kind of came out of us trying to think. Well, what's what is Drupal Commerce's place in like a big company's digital commerce platform? And we really see it as like the central nervous system. That's why we, we kind of playing on the uh, the Serbian word centar, which just means center. Um, because literally every other word that I could Google was already taken. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so basically all the domain names are gone. So we just had to invent a word, Centaur is the word, and Centaur Commerce is kind of like the central nervous system of your digital commerce platform. 
and it, it often functions very similar to just like a, like a, a custom middleware, um, you know, shuttling data where it needs to go, uh, but then presenting as the shopping cart and checkout form provider. Um, yeah, yeah, com commerce guys, Drupal guys, you know, it's all, um, it, 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 not that it didn't sound unprofessional, but it's kind of like in the US, there's a company called Five Guys and they just sling burgers. There's a moving company called Two Guys in a Truck and you hire them to move stuff in one place and Pet Boys. So, okay, I'll go to Pet Boys and hire them to change the oil in my car. Um, you know, as, aside from the, the, ex, the, uh, the, the lack of inclusivity in the name, there's also just that like smallness. Um, and we wanted to kind of break free of that. Let's see, so Michael is asking in the chat about books. We'd love a comprehensive book or fleshed out website documentation for setting a store up. Uh, and I, and um, you know, thanks for that, that question, Michael. Uh, I, I don't know that we'll ever have like a book, so to speak, but we do have um, one great contributor on the team named Lisa Streeter. And she basically wrote most of what you see at docs.drupalcommerce.org. Um, and one of the things that she's doing lately is um, kind of like like uh, surveying all of the documentation to, to identify like the gaps in that. So, so basically getting us a roadmap for documentation so that we can dedicate more of her time, more productively to fleshing out the documentation. Yeah, thanks, Chad. I'll, I'll make sure that Lisa sees that if she's not tuning in right now. Um, you know, as to, to Chad's question, he asked if using uh, multiple stores is a good solution for regional websites on different domains. Uh, and I, I would say like it depends. Um, we do do that for at least one of our customers. They're a hundred store retail chain. Um, and uh, we use a different store entity for each of their physical locations because they have different inventory in those stores. And we wanted to be able to basically let them select a store from a you know, store selector, Google map thing, um, and then filter the product catalog by what's available in that store. Uh, additionally, whenever you create a cart in commerce2.x, it is assigned to whatever the current store is. And so, so we know that that physical location is going to fulfill that order because they're only doing online orders for store pickup and some like local delivery. Um, and so, so being able to kind of focus everything on the store just made a, a really natural way for us to one, you know, track stock levels by that location and two, manage the fulfillment of those orders. Um, so I think it's, it's probably one of the primary um, uh, use cases for multi-stores. Um, who else do we know that does that? Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I know of another um, franchise company in the US that uses a store per physical location. Um, and these are on, now there's on the same domain. You can tie it to the domain, no problem. I'm trying to think, I don't think, I don't know if Matt Smart actually uses separate stores or not. I feel like they do and they use store overrides. Uh, so there's, there's, so yeah, like uh, if, you, if you use the commerce store domain module, you can select the active store based on the domain name. Um, and then, you know, further filter the product catalog, um, uh, you know, or do anything else based on that that selected store. Um, great, Matt just posted a, a case study. Yeah, like a Geosystems has a massive project done by Oomph up in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, so yeah, great case study. Yeah, so Chad, the specific system that you're gonna be looking for is the store resolver system. And this isn't a developer session, so I won't get too geeky, but uh, there, there are a variety of resolver services um, that determine things like what should my current currency be? What should the current store be? Um, what should the price be, the base price for a product? And so you'll end up writing, um, you know, a, a, a plugin that that, uh, um, that would resolve the store based on the domain or other things that you need. Um, although you could just use the commerce store domain module. Oh, hey, John's in here. Look at that. Yeah, so John from Oomph led the Leica project. And you should totally connect with him on PM if you have any questions for him. Uh, thanks, John Maruzzi, for, for that. Appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to look through the back scroll, make sure there aren't anything, any other questions we should answer. Um, all right. Looks like Matt was rocking it. All right. Well, we'll, we'll go ahead and tie it off here. 
Um, any suggestions on registrations? What do you mean by registrations, Damon? <laughs> PCI compliance. Uh, let's see, Corey, I, um, I'm not sure what WorldPay gateways have been uh, or APIs have been in integrated yet in Commerce 2.x. I only have experience with Vantive. Um, there are many APIs though that do um, use just iframes. So like Braintree's hosted fields APIs, integrated PayPal checkouts, Stripe, uh, authorized.nets, accept JS. I'm sure WorldPay has a similar API. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 on an M and A tear. <laughs> um, so they're they're just yeah buying up these companies for merchant base and then slowly maybe eventually integrating the APIs into one. So, rock on! Thanks, Michael. Ah, um, hey, so yeah, so using Drupal Commerce to sell registrations, yeah, obviously possible. You don't have to have um, you know physical things to sell to use Drupal Commerce. Um, we use it on accounts.centara.io to sell support subscriptions, very similar. It's just a recurring registration, I guess, if you will. Um, but there, there are still many uh, websites out there that sell event registrations using Drupal Commerce, so. Nice. I have not used Commerce license yet myself on Commerce 2.x, but I believe, who are we doing that for now? Ah, uh, university. We have a, a, a university client in the U.S. that um, is selling just some licensed intellectual property through their website, and we're using the Commerce license module for that now. Oh, yeah, and that project funded the Commerce email module. And a new feature in Commerce Core, admin comments, finally. So you can uh, go to an order view page and expand a little add a comment field set above the order activity log um, to, uh, to leave a comment on the order. That's a fun new feature. Great. Um, I don't know, Matt, did you already share a link to the office hours uh, blog post up above? Let's just say that we'll go ahead and update the uh, the project page on Drupal.org tonight to get the uh, the office hours on there. So if anybody has, you know, again, it's it's an hour where either Matt or Jonathan in, in a European and a North American time zone um, are available just to answer support questions, to talk about roadmap, um, blab about uh, you know module architecture, whatever you need. Uh, we, we'd love to see you in there. All right, um, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to go say goodnight to the kids. It's 9 o'clock here, and I think they're waiting on me to come kiss them goodnight. Uh, so appreciate everybody chiming in. Appreciate the feedback. Uh, again, if you have any questions at all about the direction that we're trying to go as a company, take the project to, to grow it up, um, or just you know guide our own contrib efforts, just know that like, we're still like 150% invested in making Drupal Commerce as awesome as we can. And frankly, like even in the midst of the pandemic, we've found new sponsors um, that are bringing a tremendous amount of investment to the table. And, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't shout out to ZivTech. Um, ZivTech has a client project. It's a nonprofit client and they're sponsoring months of contributed module development throughout the commerce recurring license fee invoice ecosystem. So over the next three months, four months, like look for like a lot of activity in those feature sets. And then huge thanks to ZivTech for prioritizing um, giving back in their client projects. And, and you know, obviously many others that are in here as well. You know, Ryan Hovland with his website, John Picozzi again. Thanks to everybody that sponsors this stuff. Um, we'll see you around. Hopefully we'll see you in person soon. If not uh, DrupalCon Boston, then somewhere sooner or somewhere, you know, in between. <laughs> uh, have a good night, everybody.